All right, so what do you think, Tom? The battle for L.A., has it already gone to the Clippers? Are they clearly the better team? You know, after watching that game, it confirmed that the Clippers' depth is going to be a huge problem for the rest of the league because, you know, this was a 48-win team last year in a loaded Western Conference, and they added two of the best players in the NBA. And we didn't even see what Paul George looks like on this team. Uh, and that's a big problem for the Lakers because – Come, come playoff time, they're still not going to have that third star unless Kyle Kuzma uh, makes the leap. And, man, they need someone to be able to create uh, shots for others because they were just they, – they sent the, 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 the league back three decades last, uh, last night with all the post-ups, and it was like an old Eastern Conference matchup between the Knicks and the Bulls. It was crazy watching how Anthony Davis on the left block every single time. He had 17 post-up plays last night, which was actually the most – in any game of his career. The highest for a team post-up plays last year was the San Antonio Spurs at 13 a game. So Anthony Davis, that, that offense, I just can't see how that's going to be an elite offense in today's NBA. Uh, Frank Vogel has a lot of work to do, and I think the Clippers' depth is super scary. We haven't seen them at their best yet. Okay, so what kind of evolving do you think the Lakers need to do then with Frank Vogel? He said, a quote at the end of the game, he said, we've got a long ways to go. How do you see LeBron fitting in yeah. with Anthony, and how ideally could they use him, you think? Well, I don't really love Rajon Rondo's fit with the team simply because defenses just do not get – they don't play up on him. Uh, the, I did a big digital video last, uh, last year about this effect, which is Rondo just completely ruins – all of the offense for the Lakers last season, when he played with LeBron James, it was a disaster. Um, LeBron and, and anybody else on the team, they had a really good plus minus, but it was a mess with Rajon Rondo. So I know that Frank Vogel is going to lean on Rondo to come in and try to handle the rock for, for uh, and, and release some of the scoring pressure off of LeBron James and the shot creation for, for Anthony Davis. But... Man, they're going to miss DeMarcus Cousins so much this season because he is that release valve, not just as a scorer, but as a passer, one of the most underrated big passers in the league, and they're going to desperately miss him uh, this season. So I think Dana Green had a great uh, game last night, but they have to make a lot more creative offense and move up and down the floor uh, to get easy looks for Anthony Davis. I think he needs to play more at the five, JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard. Innings eaters, you know, these are guys that you're going to play a lot and rely on in the regular season, but come postseason, I think you need to see AD at the five. Clippers bench, you mentioned at the top, they got a lot out of them. Montrez Harrell, 38 minutes. Lou Williams, we know what he can do off the bench, 36, million, uh, 36 minutes. They, no Paul George, he'll come back. From what you saw from him yesterday, are they the class of the West? Are they even more impressive after oh, yeah. seeing him on the court? Oh, yeah. I mean, it looked like Kawhi and Doc Rivers and the rest of the team have been playing that way for years. Um, and credit Doc Rivers and, and Ty Lu for establishing a game plan where, you know, be, a lot of people in the analytics world are catching heat these days because of the mid-range game and, like, uh, the idea that analytics people or numbers-based guys do not like uh, mid-range shots. But when you're Kawhi Leonard or KD or Steph Curry or Klay Thompson and you have a 55 to 60% shot in the mid-range, take it all day, all night. I mean, Kawhi Leonard last night was incredible in the mid-range and he looked so comfortable out there and so in control. It seemed like he had played a whole season uh, uh, with this with this off offense. So I think you pointed out to something very interesting right there: the minutes. Uh, Harrell and Lou Williams played significantly more minutes than Kawhi Leonard, who played just 32 in the season opener. I think that speaks volumes about how they're going to control Kawhi's minutes this year. And I think you're going to see a lot more load management days because of that depth that they have. They're going to be able to keep. Uh, Kawhi Leonard on ice and Paul George on ice for a lot of games this year. Keep him fresh for the postseason. The Lakers, on the other hand, do not have that same luxury. You know, the load management was the concern for all our Roto World friends about uh, Kawhi and even Paul George once he comes back. You're talking about the Clippers, kind of like how we've been talking about the Warriors for the past five years. They've been in the representative uh, in the NBA Finals for the West for the past five years. How far do we think that they're going to fall? you got Clay Thompson, who's out maybe the whole year. Steve Kerr was mentioning that. No longer have Kevin Durant. Where do the Warriors sit in your rankings of the West right now? Um, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, uh, talking to executives around the league, they don't know what to make of this team. Uh, you know, they could win. I could see them win 55 games this year if Draymond Green and Steph Curry want to play all 82 games. Uh, I could also see them winning 35 games in, in the Western Conference. So the, the margin 
on that team is is enormous. I and mean, you talk about Steph Curry and Draymond Green when they play on the floor without KD, without Klay Thompson, without Andre Iguodala in their careers. Without those guys on the floor, when it's just Draymond and Steph Curry, they outscore opponents by nine and a half points per 48 minutes. That's an incredible number, and it just speaks to how good and transformative they are, the gravity that Steph Curry has out there, and the defense and the, 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 the facilitation that you see with uh, Draymond Green. When those two guys are on the floor, they're a 55-win team. But the depth is a huge concern, and if Steph and Draymond get hurt and everything falls on D'Angelo Russell's shoulders, this season could go south real quick. So I think, yes, they could be the story of the season, and Steph Curry could win MVP. I'm just not betting on it. Yeah, the MVP talk for Curry is fascinating because the lack of depth is the reason why I think a lot of people are talking about him because he will have to be maybe the do-it-all scoring threat for them most of the time along with D'Angelo Russell. As you look at the MVP early favorites here, you got the, the winner from last year, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is the odds-on favorite. Do you still see him as most likely to win it once again this year? I don't like his chances. Oh. I just think he had the toughest summer of any NBA star. When you talk about playing for the Greek national team, uh, going to China, the shoe tour all around the world, accepting speeches, MVP speeches in L.A. and then going to Athens and then coming back to Vegas and then doing a Milwaukee uh, MVP thing. It was an uh, absolute grueling offseason for Giannis Antetokounmpo. He had the deepest playoff run of his career. I am just super worried about the wear and tear playing in China with the Greek national team. It didn't do him any favors, I don't think, from a basketball sense. And I just think that the comments you heard from him, that he was fatigued, that he was tired both mentally and physically this summer, Look, Clay Thompson, I mean, uh, uh, Kawhi Leonard, LeBron James, Steph Curry, they took the summer off. Giannis Antetokounmpo, I just don't see how he's going to last an entire season and exceed expectations for the Milwaukee Bucks. Because if you're going to look for an MVP, you need to exceed expectations. That's what the MVP award is all about. And I just think with the Milwaukee Bucks, how do you take a step forward after win winning 60 games last year? I don't like his chances. I actually think Joel Embiid is the safer pick there. I was going to pick that because I was thinking you, you have the uh, 76 No, see, I picked it first. I picked it first. <laughs> I, you, you I was going to pick jump it on for that you. Island. No, I was going to pick it for you because you've said that you think the 76ers are going to come out of it and be the top seed. In the East, and, and more times than not, it's one of the top two teams in the in the conference that has the MVP, and so you, you like Embiid. Okay, what if you had a dark horse? Who do you like as your dark horse? I would throw out there uh, Nikola Jokic for, uh, for Denver as the dark horse candidate. Yeah, I mean, if he continues to improve, I, I just worry about his conditioning. I mean, I, I don't think he's in the right shape to be that. I think if he was going to lose weight and, and be a little bit slimmer for the NBA season and the grind after what he went through in the playoffs last year against Portland, I, I wanted to see him in better shape coming into this season or else I would have been on that train with you. Uh, but I think Joel Embiid, I think he's outside the top three in terms of odds, so I think he's the dark horse pick because I think Philadelphia, with that defense, Josh Richardson is one of the most underrated players in the league, uh, and I think Tobias Harris has another level to get to in, in late game situations. Ben Simmons, if he adds a three point shot, I don't think it's going to happen this year, but if he adds a three point shot, they're so much harder to guard. So I just think that the 76ers are underrated. There's a lot of value there, and I think just Al Horford is able to uh, be such a good defender for them. Actually, uh, a uh, playmaker, kind of like Draymond Green uh, in the Eastern Conference there. I think this is going to be a really big season for Philly, and Joel Embiid is going to be awesome. I think he's got the right mentality coming into the season. I think he's lost some weight, and I think he's really taken this this year seriously. Uh, there really are a lot of players in the, in the mix there. Didn't even mention Harden, and you, you got Kawhi. You wonder about him, and LeBron always in the conversation, so it could be fascinating. Rookie of the Year was supposed to be a little bit more of a slam dunk. Maybe it still is with Zion Williamson, uh, but he'll be out with a a meniscus injury in the, in the knee. What, what more can you tell us about that and when might we see him back? Uh, if you hear the comments out of David Griffin, the, the executive VP of basketball operations, it is not a pretty picture. I mean, he's being trying to be positive, but he's also saying that they're going to take a cautious approach here. And I think with him, you always know that he wants to take the long-term view uh, of, of the superstar player like that. Look, 
he had a knee issue at Duke last year. He had conditioning issues. Uh, even David Griffin mentioned that at Summer League, um, that he didn't come in with the best shape and that he needed to work on his conditioning in Summer League. They pulled him from Summer League because of injury concerns. I think this is going to be uh, a tough year for, for Zion Williamson simply because his game is so much velocity and force that they need to make sure that knee is right. And not only that, his other knee is right. I mean, the guy waddles down the floor uh, as, as much he is a, a sensation. A, a bull with pogo sticks is like a, what I like to call it. Uh, I just think they're going to take a cautious approach with him. And I think that opens the door for Ja Morant, who averaged 11.9 assists per 36 minutes in the preseason. Sensational athlete. Uh, I think he's going to be surprising a lot of folks in the NBA this year with how good and NBA ready he is. Kind of like what Trey Young was last season. There is no Luka Doncic this year. I don't think Zion Williamson is going to be healthy enough. So I think Trey Young this year is going to be Ja Morant. I think he's the best odds mm. to win the win the Rookie of the Year. I'm going to give you my dark horse, Michael Porter Jr. He'll he'll find a way to convince Michael Malone that he has to get in the lineup, and he'll play and he'll be a contributor on a playoff team. You know, I love that, but he needs to get opportunities. He needs to yeah. start, and I think Ja Morant has got all – of the opportunities uh, you can find. I think Brandon Clark is a sleeper. He is going to be all rookie team. I love Brandon Clark's game and Matisse Tybal over there in Philly. All, all, both of my favorites coming into the draft and I think in the preseason you're seeing why. Uh, Rui Hachimura, also a name that people are throwing out there. That was fun. Uh, that's all the time we have today, Tom. Uh, good talk. Let's do this every week. How about that? Let, let's do it. Joel Embiid, MVP train. <laughs>